Hey, good morning, good evening, whatever time you're listening to this. Hello, my friends. You know, forgiving others is something Jesus says is a non-negotiable on our Christian journeys. But why? We're going to explore that today in this third lesson in our Spirit-Led Transformation course. Many times we feel that after we've been saved and we know that we're forgiven, that we've made it, we're going to heaven, you know, but salvation is just the starting point to what Jesus wants to give us, which is everything in abundance, more than you can expect, life in its fullness until you overflow, as it says in John 10.10. 10. And as you know, that verse also says that the thief, who is the devil, is out to steal, steal kill, and destroy us. And one way he does that is to keep us from going any further towards what God really wants for us, which is total transformation, spirit, soul, and body. Overcoming our fleshly and carnal desires, the entire sin issue, the beauty of God's grace to forgive us, those are all central themes in our spirit-led transformation. But another equally important one is that we are forgiven in order to forgive others. God demonstrates exactly what he wants us to do for others when he forgives us. He is teaching us by example. That's a good teacher, right? Most of the time, this feels like a really hard thing to do. So we just sort of put it in the back of our minds and leave it there, right? We have a problem with forgiving someone who has done us wrong because we want them brought to justice. Now, don't get me wrong. I know it is very true that people have done bad things to you. They've done bad things to me too. Maybe there are things that you want to scream about and make them pay for. Any wrong does done to us feels difficult to let go of. As a matter of fact, any wrong done to someone we love is also difficult to let go of. We want to hang on to those things, thinking that forgiving the person will just let them off the hook. And we don't want to let them off the hook. We want to reel them in, make them pay for what they did, right? However, you aren't hurting them by not forgiving them. You are only hurting yourself. You haven't hooked them. You've gotten yourself stuck in a mire that feels impossible to get free from. You are perseverating over what they did to you so much that you can't even think straight. And yet they're doing just fine. They're likely not even thinking about you. Not for a minute do they feel guilty or remorseful. And I'm not saying if they did something illegal to let them go free. That's not what I'm saying. Let the legal system take care of any laws they've broken. But it does you no good to hang on to the wrongs that they did to you. It's only keeping you further away from God because God clearly says we must forgive others or he won't forgive us. It's kind of a scary statement, actually. But in Matthew 18, 21 through 22, Peter asked Jesus how many times he should forgive someone. Like, when can he stop is what he's asking. But Jesus tells him 70 times 7, which actually means often or abundantly. It doesn't mean count to 490 and stop. It means Jesus wants us to forgive like God forgives all the time, ceaseless without counting. So when I look at my life and think about how many times I ignored God's directive telling me to stop eating sugar, that would be a whole lot more than 490, I can assure you. I couldn't even count the number because even though I was a Christian, I was also a really stubborn and willful sinner because I wasn't doing what God told me to do. I call this sin because I know as early as 1977 and many times through the years that God instructed me to stop eating sugar and I didn't listen. 
So when God tells us to stop doing something, he's not just giving us good advice. He's telling us something that will save our lives. And when we acknowledge that he said it, but refuse to do it, that's sin. Your sin or the thing God has told you to do that you haven't done yet will be different from mine, but the principle is the same. What God tells us to do that we haven't done is sin. Okay, back to Matthew 18. So Jesus tells Peter to forgive others 70 times seven, and then Jesus realizes Peter doesn't get it. <laughs> so he tells him a story. So let me read verses 25 to, through 35 in the message. The kingdom of God is like a king who decides to who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant, and I'm going to call him dude, okay, just because that kind of clarifies who I'm talking about, was brought before him, the king, was brought before the king. Dude had run up a lot of debt, $100,000. Another version says a million. It doesn't matter how much. The point is, it was a lot of money that dude owed the king, okay? Dude couldn't pay up. So the king ordered him, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at a slave market. And the poor dude threw himself at the king's feet and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing all of his debt. Dude was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him 10 bucks. And he seized him by the throat and demanded pay up now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But dude wouldn't do it. He had the poor guy arrested and put in jail till the debt was paid. And when the others saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summons dude and says, you evil servant, I, gave your, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me. For mercy, shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to dude. Other versions say, handed him over to the jailers to torture him until he paid back his entire debt. And here's the kicker. Here's the clincher. That's exactly what my father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. Now, let me ask you, what if instead of forgiving you, God held you accountable for every time you didn't listen to him, which is sin, remember? This story is really telling us that when we refuse to forgive others, we will be tortured, not by God, but because of the absence of peace we feel with him. And Jesus was saying, hey, folks, you know my dad? Well, he's not joking about this, right? <laughs> this ain't a, just a good suggestion. It's what you got to do. And we know we have not forgiven someone if we're holding a grudge against them. If every time we think about them, we cringe and we want something bad to happen to them, that's unforgiveness. In Romans 2, Paul talks about when we judge others, we are guilty of sin. Now, this is really no different from when we willfully choose not to forgive others because that's really judging what they did. And maybe we think it's cut and dried, but we really don't have all the facts because we aren't God. We don't know what's going on inside that person to make them do what they did. It's still sin. I understand that. But we're not the ones to judge them. Romans 2, 3 through 4 in Passion Translation says, What makes you think that you will escape God's judgment? Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Have you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you. Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. That's an ouch right there. 
And then down in verse eight, another big ouch is when he tells us that God's wrath will fall upon us when we do this. This is what is happening when we have accepted Christ but refuse to do what we know God wants us to do. We don't see it that way because we're pointing a whole lot of fingers at the one who wronged us, and that's all we can see. Romans 2.10 in the Passion Translation, though, Paul tells us this, and this is the positive thing that happens when we forgive others. When we do what pleases God, which is forgiving others, we can expect unfading glory, true honor, and continual peace. Peace with God is at the core of why he forgives us and why we must forgive others no matter what they've done. Now, when I was 11, I something huge happened to me. And it was so big in my mind that I didn't even consider forgiving it as an option. I was molested by an older man who was a friend of our family. It happened in what I considered the safest place in the world, my grandparents' house. Now, this story is in my first book, Sweet Grace, so I'm not going to go into it in depth. But the, the thing is, I didn't feel I could tell anyone about it because I would have, was afraid they would take his side instead of mine. Remember, I'm only 11, okay? So I vowed to protect myself. He was from out of state and was only around occasionally, so I planned to never be alone in any room with him and never again stay overnight at Grandma's when he was there. For years, in silence, I carried this fear, disgust, and anger for this man. Food became my way to comfort myself and make me feel at peace. I could forget all about him for a while. And it was also a way to protect myself by being okay to be larger so that no other men would hurt me. I reasoned that if someone really cared for me in the right way, they wouldn't be put off if I had a few extra pounds on my body. Until I understood the power of forgiveness, I was bound by my abuser's power over my mind. I was afraid of any man who looked at me or said something to me that was complimentary. I was suspicious of any men except those I knew and trusted. And even after he died and I was an adult, I didn't realize the spirit of control I had fallen under. Anytime something triggered me to think about him, I would see myself as a frightened, innocent, paralyzed little girl with him looming over me like a huge monster. And one day I got on an elevator at a denominational headquarters where I was working and I had hit, the, hit a milestone with the diet I was on and had lost 100 pounds. I was really elated. I got on the elevator with a man who was a department director, and I, I didn't know him well, but I knew he was headed to my floor. And so the, the doors closed, and he looks me up and down and says, you're looking really good, and I froze. I was back in that bedroom in the second story of my grandparents' house. I was 11 years old again didn't hear a word he said after that, but I think he invited me to have dinner with him or something. All I could think about was getting off the elevator as fast as I could. I don't know if he was coming on to me or not, but I wasn't taking any chances. And friends, that was the day I intentionally started eating sugar again that I hadn't eaten in probably a year and putting back on the 100 pounds I just lost, plus more. I didn't want to take the chance that my new look was what enticed this supposedly upstanding man. Now, living this way was no way to live, but I reasoned uh, that many others had more terrifying experiences with men. And I knew that was true, because this man molested me. 
but he didn't rape me. And I thought I should be able to get over this. But the problem was the little girl me had been traumatized no matter what happened. She had been traumatized and until I helped her, she would steer me emotionally. Nothing in life happens by chance. And so me being at a Joyce Meyer conference when she told her story of being continually raped by her father was no accident. This was early in her ministry, and a group of friends and I had made the two-hour trip to hear her at one of her first conferences in a large church in St. Louis. So after telling her story, she added that abuse can happen in many different ways, but if it has instilled fear and repulsion for a person in your life, you were obligated, obligated to forgive that person, even if they are not still alive, because it will release the control they have over you. It will put the justice in God's hands rather than yours. So I forgave my abuser that day. I stood and I prayed the prayer with her and forgave the abuser, even though he was already deceased. I simply said to God, I choose to forgive this man for what he did to me and the fear it caused me. I hand this to you. I ask you to do justice in this situation, and I accept your peace back into my life. Oh, friends, what freedom, what joy, what release. I had seen this man as a huge monster looming over me, and that day, I saw him like a little bitty wimp. And right there standing in that church, I shook my head and snickered, really, <laughs> thinking I've been afraid of this all my life. Thank you, Jesus, for the concept of forgiving others. Forgiving, forgiving others is really a process we go through to disentangle or release ourselves from others who have hurt us and let God take care of us and them. It's the reason Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 37, forgive others and you will be forgiven. It's the reason Paul reiterates that in Colossians 3, 13, when he says, forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So God wants to demonstrate his principles of forgiveness in our personal lives and interactions with others. We want retribution, but he asks we show them mercy and leave everything else up to him. So let's kind of recap why we should forgive others. One, because he forgave us. Two, because he asks us to forgive others. Actually, he commands us to forgive others. Three, so we demonstrate his forgiveness to the world. Four, because we understand God is the only one who can judge others. Five, because it releases us from that person's control over us. And six, it's the only way for us to be at peace. So when we hold things against someone, we don't realize how it affects everything in our lives. We rehearse that scene over and over. We feel if we can just rewrite the story, we can forget about it, but we can't. Our minds and our emotions won't let us forget. So we are stuck in this never ending reality horror story. Only forgiveness releases us. The same thing happens if we were maybe yelled at by a parent, teased by a sibling, or just felt unloved, shamed, demeaned, jolted, snubbed, abandoned, called worthless, worthless, stupid, ugly, a know-it-all, not part of the family, or any other number of things that we learn from others as children. Because every feeling that comes up in you today can be traced back to someone who made you feel that way when you were younger. Or maybe you didn't even know that you could forgive them for that, 
release them to God and then allow God's peace to flood your soul. But this is the power behind forgiveness. We aren't saying what this person did was right. We are just releasing them to God and from having control over us. We don't even have to say it to their face. We just tell God specifically what we forgive them for and release them to him. And there are further steps we can do to make sure we're holding, we're not holding anything against God because some of these things do relate to the way we see God. So I'm not going to go into all of them, but I will just touch on a few things to think about. So like I said, many things we go through as children affect our lives today and how we feel about God as well as, you know, our emotional um, state of mind. So, but how we feel about God is also involved in that. So for instance, we may not even understand why we feel Father God is angry at us or we're scared of him. And if I were working with you personally or in my group, I'd start exploring with you a time when maybe your dad got angry at you or when he or another authority figure might have abused you. Even if it was verbally, physically, or sexually, it doesn't matter what the abuse was. You're a kid and it traumatized you. Because then, as a child, we transfer these feelings to how we feel about Father God later, because God is a father figure. We know our father. It relates, and we carry that over. And similar or more uh, or equally difficult experiences with our mothers, our siblings, our peers can relate, or even authority figures can relate to how we feel about the Holy Spirit and Jesus and Father God. So we carry these things, in, these hurts from childhood into adulthood. We think we buried them, but they can affect every area of our life unless we go through this forgiveness process. The beauty, beautiful part of this type of forgiveness is that it leads to experiencing God's truth as he reassures of us of how he wants to work in our lives. Being willing to forgive others is where it all begins. Now, who knew that forgiveness could set us free in such profound ways? Identifying hurts done against me that I haven't forgiven and then forgiving them has helped me work through many strongholds that found their roots in my childhood. And that those, all of that is in my book, Sweet Surrender, Breaking Strongholds. That's a freebie, not in my, even in my notes. Anyway, this has set me free to follow God for my forever lifestyle change plan, which is different from a diet. It's allowing God to help me overcome my specific food weaknesses and issues in my life and give me strength to follow him. He gave, he gave me boundaries that I use for how I eat, move, and live. And I am always willing to share specifics. However, I don't expect anyone to follow my exact plan. I don't even teach people to follow my plan. But when you surrender to God and begin to get closer to hearing from him, he will lead you to your perfect plan, tailor-made for you, if that's your desire. It's not going to force it on you. It has to be your desire. And I teach you how to go about that in the first course in Overcomers Academy, which is Journey to Transformation. Now, we also have this new course that I'm developing now called Spirit-Led Transformation, which is um, comprised of these podcast episodes that I'm that are that are really birthed out of the book of Romans. So I'm adding the videos of these episodes along with the content that you're hearing. The course adds these specific action steps and challenges that I have that are only available with this course that is in Overcomers Academy. So that's the only place you're going to get the action steps and the challenges. Now, let me ask you, 
what would your life be like if you could dig deep to discover what really is holding you back? Maybe it's something you've buried so deep that you don't even know that that's what you're, that, that he, you don't even know that that's what you're not forgiving someone for and that that is keeping your life in this kind of depressing spin cycle. Whatever it is, God wants to use his not so secret weapon to set you free and demonstrate his forgiveness to the world at the same time. And that secret weapon is forgiving others who have done you wrong. So let me pray with you. Father God, Father God, please show each of the people listening today, those in their lives who have hurt them and that they have not forgiven. Help them know how to forgive them and release them to you in Jesus' name. So in the link for Overcomers uh, Academy, um, that will be the link for Overcomers Academy, excuse me, will be down in the show notes. And um, that is TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash overcomers. So if you want to join, please go there and, and join us. We'd be glad to have you. Until next week, sweet grace for your journey.